Listen, you're not gonna find anything on me, okay? Trust me. Empty your pockets into the tray, sir, or we'll have to. <sighs> your pockets, sir? Lady, the problem isn't in my pants. No! Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. We got a big week in X-Men. We had a, a new issue of X-Men. We had, what is it, the, the X-Men Onslaught Revelation, as well as X-Men Legends number seven. And here to talk to me about this, as always, is my good friend, the X-Men historian, the Marvel fish not himself. Doc, how you doing, buddy? I'm good, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for bringing me on. Thanks for uh, thanks for continuing to do this, even in spite of downturn in X-Men quality. <laughs> well, this week was a bit of an upturn. I, I didn't read it was. book five, but. Uh, well, you had X-Men three, you had X-Men Legends and you had Onslaught. So yeah. not, not too bad. Absolutely. So I guess the big one we'll talk about first is X-Men Onslaught Revelation. We got the I, the news that this thing is going to be rolling out into its own new series. We'll get to that after we talk about the issue. So it's weird that they made this a one shot like X-Men Onslaught Revelation. There is no way that you could read this comic book as a standalone book. Like you would just confuse the hell out of you. If you had yeah. read, read all of Way of X and then you know, even parts of other uh, X-Men comics. It would be literally, literally impenetrable, Doc. I, it really would be. This, this you can't read this as, a, as a, going like, oh wait, do I have to go reread all of Way of X? I read it once already, and Jesus Christ, I had to go and like it was check some references. Quite convoluted, a lot of uh, metaphorical uh, things going on. Also, the the fact that it was taking place in two like dimensions one one story yeah. taking place on Krakoa itself and the other story taking place within the mind of legion made it a little bit confusing and it seemed like they were moving over to mars at one point uh interesting enough uh i felt it was a bit disappointing you know uh we'll it was. get to the onslaught part what that i thought was disappointing the art once again was was really good i hope that uh bob quinn and, and Sly sprayer keep working together but i don't know, I just, I think it's weird that they decided to use Fabian Cortez as like the character that ignited the spark of, of understanding and realization within Krakoa. Yeah. Um, look, I, nobody's a big fan of Fabian Cortez. Um, I, I mean, I guess this was Cy Spurrier's attempt to try to make him relevant or useful or something or at least interesting because he's really not that interesting of a character um you know he's just a power yeah. booster and an asshole yeah. he's you know and, and and you know him expanding his backstory and everything he's just a whiny rich kid that yeah. wants to be rebellious but it was like it was like like this weird examination of well you know, privilege that he 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 felt the need to be offended in some way. So I, I don't know, or, or or like he had a like he had a struggle uh, that he really didn't have. So he kind of made up his own and yeah, basically became an asshole to do it. Um, yeah, that was kind of disappointing. But so the the thing is, is that finally I guess the onslaughts uh, taking over Kako, which is pretty anticlimactic. They're going to have this big murder party that's going yeah. on at the same time. I believe it's uh, it's Nightcrawler is taking Pixie into the safe kind confines of Legion's head and explaining what's everything that's happening as it's sort of happening on Krakoa as Charles is deleting the backup files of all the, the, the mutants on Krakoa. So if they die, they can't be resurrected. Although if, how is Onslaught going to have power if everyone that he's infected is dead and they don't come back? That's another idea. So, so while this yeah. is happening, there's another team that's been put out there that have been experimenting. You know, uh, I guess they've been affected by the Crucible. So they're they're like, uh, you know, they got mushrooms, they got music and all this stuff trying to quell the the uprising murder fest that's going on as Nightcrawler is explaining, you know, with all the exposition of all the things that, that are actually happening. Yeah, it was like this was they did not do. I, w I will say that one one big problem i had with this was they really couldn't explain this story in in art at all like because it's it's way too convoluted and honestly this was this this seemed like the 
the biggest example of Cy Spurrier uh, trying to be smarter than he is. And it's like, I understood like they were, they were kind of going with this like multi-pronged attack and everything. And all the, all the uh, kind of supporting characters from way of X thus far, you know, uh, Dr. Nemesis, Dazzler, Pixie, uh, Loa, Mercury, Dust, Dust, all these characters that lost character. Mm-hmm. Um, they were all, you know, it was their his way of tying them all in and making them important in this. But really, they they weren't. Um, I mean, the Crucible was interesting. I do figure out. I think what it is is since um, he was having Xavier delete all those files. Um, he was eating the lost memory. So now if there's no memories and they bring them all back, um, essentially as blank slates, he can eat all of the, that, that blank space in their, in their memories and kind of get one big giant gorge of a meal to, I don't know, put him okay, back so together I took it differently. I, I took it. He was deleting them. So once they died, there was no resurrection. Yeah, I, I, well, you could be right. I took it as they're still going to resurrect them. But since he was eating that one day, you know, you got backed up on Tuesday, you died on Thursday. He was eating your Wednesday's memories that didn't get backed up, um, that he was going to eat their entire lives memories because there's nothing to back up and it was it was it was it was convoluted it didn't entirely make sense and as you said it is it was pretty anticlimactic yeah you be onslaught's a big big time uh villain yeah get him in there he finally takes physical form as he's been kind of called out and brought out and he takes over charles xavier becomes this big hulking beast and then they just use sand to cover him and uh, eat him yeah um (laughs) like first of all the the final form of onslaught that was that he actually manifested it was just ch- chart like a giant version of skin like a skinny giant version of xavier with a looked like a bowling ball on his head you remember that uh that one uh marvel villain that has like a giant eight ball for a head or wait, I don't even know if it was a Marvel villain. I think it was like some cartoon villain from like the fucking tick or something. He, he, he was just, he was a skinny dude that had a giant eight ball as a head. That's what it looked like here. Um, Yeah. And so it was, it was disappointing the manifestation of onslaught because onslaught's got a really, really cool design. And I mean, it's so obviously very nineties design, but it's still a really cool design and they didn't use it except for that one kind of flash forward, you know, onslaughts fantasy panel. Um, They didn't really use it. So it, it was really weak. And this, this felt like all they did was just repeat the finale from the original onslaught event. Uh, except for this time, it was a bunch of dust and mutants stopping Onslaught instead of the Avengers all diving into him and ending up in the Heroes Reborn world. Uh, it was it was it was just really boring. It was pretty anticlimactic, and this leads to I guess there's a you know Krakoa is essentially now a hippie commune. They're all socialists, and yeah. then uh, you know they're going to be there's there's a new team called the Legionnaires. That are going to be operating in Legion's mind. It's going to be uh, Nightcrawler, Pixie, Juggernaut. Don't know what the hell he's doing in there. Who is it? The uh, Doctor Nemesis. Doctor Nemesis. But it also looked like Blind was there. I don't know about that one. Well, the thing is, that's that's that was the most interesting part of this entire thing. The little tease because Blind is there. Blind is a. Um, uh, 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 she can see the future. She's a precog. Like she was over in the the right side, right next to Juggernaut, and they have that rule about precogs. I mean, granted, I know we're going into Inferno now, so well, it maybe feel like any of this is related to each other because we've got 
you know, uh, Magneto is on trial, but here he's protecting Charles and stuff. He's like, I don't even know when this is happening. Yeah, I, I don't know where the, you know, I, I feel like this is happening after Trial of Magneto or and before Inferno or or maybe before the Trial of Magneto, but then it would seem like, I don't know. This does, n- None of this makes sense in the context of all of the X books, but... Hey. I recommend the comic book. I do. The Way of X. You know, it was an ending. I, I recommend setting up something new. Is just yeah. I I definitely recommend it if you read Way of X. Um, but don't be surprised when you got to read it like three times, and don't be surprised when you get really frustrated, um, by Cy Spurrier trying to pretend that he's a lot smarter than he is. Yeah, it's not nearly as clever as he thinks it is. Oh, let's get into X Men. We're already running out yes. of time here, Doc. We've got uh, Pepe the Raz on art. We got Jerry Duggan on uh, on writing for X Men number three. Now this thing, um, it's <laughs> it's a mess. The end of it's pretty good. The end the of, beginning of it makes makes no sense. The art's fantastic at times, but does get very confusing while there's this battle because we finally get the uh, the high evolutionary shows up on Earth. Remember seeing him in issue number one? He's kind of in the background of Game World, and he's like. Take our sphere because the humans, they're going to kill the climate and this will like, they won't die as fast or don't. And it's like, we're going to fight. Like, what? Get out yeah, of here. I, this is stupid. I, I feel like I've watched, I, I've read this issue of X-Men. Like, th- this is like the third time I've read the exact same issue of X-Men. Um, because that's really all it is, is hey, let's uh, use our powers like mutant friggin' Voltron and uh, then something something humans and mutants and not doing stuff and letting the let's let's save the uh, humans uh, for no reason momentum. what about this character that's in here that's it's high evolutionary's daughter or whatever supposedly has the powers of quicksilver and scarlet witch it seems like uh you know completely unbeatable not only can you know you alter reality and everything but you're so fast no one can see you and they just defeat her well i mean yeah sync well they defeat her because sync basically copies her powers and then uses them better than her because that doesn't that's make sense. Sinks I, you these powers. I know this. You know this. That doesn't make <laughs> any sense. Sink is just a. He's he's just a. He's an ex, a superfluous character in this book. When you have Rogue, or Rogue is the superfluous character. I don't know, but this is them trying to make Sink into a thing, and that there's a reason. Sense. No, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense that he would be better at using someone else's powers than they. When they've had it their whole lives. Yes. And now Rogue being good at using somebody's powers always made sense because she also, in addition to copying their powers, she was also copying their minds. Like she was absorbing their memories and everything. So she remembers how to use them because she remember the person she you know absorbed them from remembers but she's limited to only absorbing well no not just mutant powers because she absorbed the well carol um (laughs) and no so she's i I don't understand why sync other than i I don't know why they're using sync like this honestly jerry duggan decided sync was a thing yeah it was important so every issue sync is going to save the day Exactly. And it's really not all that interesting. Um, it doesn't make any sense. I'm like, this this is stupid. And then what's her nuts? Uh, Rogue's like, I can't believe we lost or she she beat our butt or asses. Are like, I guess I watched a different fight. Yeah, this was this was honestly it was like the sync validation issue. Rogue being the experienced version of sync and the better version of sync just needed to be there. To just validate, hey, he's a better rogue than I am. Um, that's what it felt like. It was it was it another like, case of that. Don't let the bomb blow up in the air. It's like, what is this high evolutionary guy? Stupid? Explode it. What are you waiting yeah. for? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, I understand what it was. Like he was giving them the choice. But when they 
decided they didn't want that choice, what what was the point? Like, okay, exactly. Well, there you, was no point. Yeah, he you just can't. left. He was like, "All right, guys, we'll see you later." Yeah, like the guy I you're came for us on Game World. Yeah, I I came, I came to give you guys a choice. You chose. No, I didn't like your choice. And yeah. Before he could give them information, Jerry needed an action scene for no reason, and that's why it felt out of place and stupid. Yeah. And now, look, I, I've never been a huge fan of. I like the High Evolutionary as a concept. I much prefer him being involved on like Mount Wondegore rather than uh, Counter Earth, because that's where he came from in this. That, that was the whole point of like, oh, we didn't see this giant spaceship coming because it came right out of the sun. Because it came from too. Counter Earth, that was right in the beginning. Yeah, um, yeah. If something flew out of the sun, it wouldn't make yeah. it because it would disintegrate before it got here. Well, it flew around the sun and then. It's but regardless, I, I, I That's know it, it, it came, came from, from the sun. Well, it came from the sun's side of the Earth, where there normally wouldn't the be. What does that mean? The, the Earth revolves around the sun while revolving I, itself. I no, I understand that. My, my point is that. Most alien visitors are going to be coming from not the sun side. Like they're going to be come from, they're going to be coming from like outer space, not closer, not within your own solar system. Yeah, because they would burn up. Yes, I, yeah. But he's coming from counter earth, which is literally I'm on just the, saying that was it a stupid rotates, line. It is. It was a stupid line by a stupid author. Um, the only cool thing, really, they got information, whatever. Yeah, they got, they got the information that Jerry Duggan needed to give them by creating a, a conflict that made no sense and was uh, not all that well executed. So we get more information about who who was the first one. It's, uh, Cordis F. Jones first. And yeah, then, that was in the other thing. That was information from him. But then we got the that the, the, the guy that wants to go to Mars. Yeah, we got Orcus. that. Yeah, the Phi Long. Yeah, so um, he's working with Orcus. Yeah, he's and then working with the Guy, other right? guy, uh, Doctor Stasis. Yes, he's yeah. working with Ben Ulrich to expose mutant resurrection. Yeah, um, you know, the best he, parts of the whole book. It really was, and honestly, those should have been interspersed throughout the book so that I wasn't so fucking bored and like dreading finishing it. Like, I mean, hey, it gave me a good ending because I actually gave a shit about the ending. Like, look, I, I'm sorry, I don't give a shit about the way Jerry writes any of these these X-Men, I do care right now. The most interesting part of the writing he's doing is on the villains that he's establishing. Honestly, uh, can we just cancel X-Men and give him people that want to hurt the X-Men, number one? Because that's the only thing he seems to be interested in writing. Well, that's still really interesting. There's some stupid jokes and stuff here, but once again, I will recommend this one almost based solely on the art. The art here is fantastic. I really enjoyed it. It was a little muddled at points, but I do not feel that was on Pepe the Rans. I believe that was on the script itself. And uh, it, 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 this is better than I expected still. It, it, yeah, it's still a little better than I expected. Um, I, I give it a mild recommendation, very mild, yeah, but yeah, only, yeah, only really... Tepid. For about like the last five pages, that's about the only reason that I I give yeah, it a recommendation. It was, was really good, but man, that was just it was so such a forced conflict. It was like this is silly. This does whatever. Yeah, we need to get a, a decent editor in there. Now it gets us to X Men Legends number seven. I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be honest with you, Doc. I haven't read this. I didn't. I didn't get to it. Was oh. it good? It was. It was pretty good. Um, I I, I is this Larry Hama Wolverine. Yeah, um, I feel like Larry hasn't written Wolverine in a while. A lot of the same way that like Claremont hasn't written the X Men in a while. And when Claremont's come back and done his, you know, returns to the X books, it's taken him a, a handful of issues to really kind of start getting in that groove again. And I feel like Larry, um, Larry wasn't entirely in the headspace of writing Wolverine yet because it took him a solid five to ten issues on wolverine originally to really get that book like not kicking on all cylinders um 
And it felt like this was very, very, very much a warm up issue for him. Like he should have written about three other stories that never saw print before this, just so that he could get into like back into that Wolverine 1990s Wolverine groove. Um, but it was, it was pretty good. Um, the, the, the story itself was kind of a very common recent, like Wolverine trope story, which is Wolverine chasing after like child traffickers. Oh, I was going to say Wolverine's in a bar and then someone starts a fight with it. No. Well, he goes into a bar, hey, but, I got to, but he goes into the bar to, because he's already on the case of child traffickers and he starts off by basically he's in his civvies um, and he brings in Jubilee like he's going to try to sell her to the tri- the, the you know the the mutant child traffickers and you know she's obviously bait for them um, and then it goes sideways um, he they he ends up killing a couple of them jubilee ends up uh kind of incapacitating a couple of them uh and then yukio shows up so you know long time uh wolverine kind of side character yuki and, and storm's best friend yukio shows back up and she's kind of in her like very punk rock phase from the the 80s and 90s um, and she goes on to help, uh, Wolverine with, with tracking these, these traffickers down, uh, because she had already been on the case from, she had come from Tokyo. He was coming from the States. They were, uh, and they ended up meeting in Oyama, um, to, to, and they team up on, on this, on this case. So it's an interesting kind of uh very typical more modern wolverine story where he's been doing this a lot and i feel like this goes back to that trope of wolverine always having like teenage girl sidekicks hey, he's that, got one on every continent doesn't I matter know. where he goes he's got one waiting for him. yeah um and like his weird it, it's like the very very dad vereen thing um so i wasn't super excited and it felt like this was kind of a little bit slow it does feel like this is definitely going to be three issues uh i think that explains why uh issue 10 is the um uh, scott yeah fabian coming back um so it also has death strike because you know this this is apparently set around the time of uh wolverine number like 33 ish um so it's that was whenever he was in constant conflict uh death strike was a common uh nemesis around that period uh and then it sets up for omega red in the next issue because you know yuki or uh death strike gets away um we finish up with one of the it was like these two teenage girls that had been kidnapped to be trafficked. One of them got saved, but the other one hadn't yet. And, but the one that got saved was a teleporter. So she teleports Wolverine onto this like freighter that the bad guys are taking everybody away. in. Um, and you know, it's obviously on its way to Russia or China. I think it's on it. Or no. Yeah. It's on its way to China to Shanghai. So he's going to end up in conflict with uh death strike, probably on the boat. And then next issue, we get Omega red. There you go. Do you recommend this one? I am. I, I, I will. I, I will definitely recommend it, but I think that it's, it's also a very kind of tepid recommendation. Um, I just hope that it gets up, better. But it's not a huge step up. It, it is. Um, I liked it better than the Peter David issues because it seems like maybe, maybe it's going to matter a little bit more because this seems like it might be the actual first interaction that we see. Like, you know, it's retconning in a previous uh, conflict with Omega Red before X Men number four um, from the from like nineteen ninety three. 
So it's oh. retconning something in from before that. All right. So that's this week at X-Men. We had high hopes for uh, X-Men Onslaught Revelation. Certainly didn't live up to it, but it was an ending. <laughs> We've got apparently the start of a new Legionnaires. There's no way that's going to be an ongoing, Doc. That's going to be a miniseries. Oh, it's definitely a miniseries. We're not getting any ongoings from X-Men in the near future. Everything is going to be a miniseries from here on out, at least for, for a bit. We've got uh, X-Men number three. We've got new information on Cordyceps Jones. Now the X-Men know where this character is coming from that has sent the, the villains in the first two issues. We also got some follow-up as far as a, a couple of the other villains that have been uh, that are being introduced. That was the most interesting part. And then X-Men, uh, X-Men Legends number seven, Larry Hama's Return to Wolverine. Doc says he's recommended it, but it ain't the greatest thing he's ever read. Yep. Uh, Billy Tan's art was, or wait, I think it was Billy Tan. I don't remember if it was Billy Tan or Philip Tan. Damn it. Um, the art's great, though. It really is. Billy Tan, Doc, you were right. Ah, you're right. 